when we are dealing with uh, travelogical situations in industry, uh, what we do is uh, oil analysis. So oil analysis is basically an analyzing the wear debris that comes out in the oil. So, so this is also third body. So third body is really important um, for understanding the wear situation of your tribal pair. So is that okay? Is that the answer for you? Sir, I am thinking like, sir, our knee joint. Uh -huh. Yes, sir, the upper part and lower parts like uh, uh, first and second body. Uh -huh. And the joint between them, sir, like a, a fluid attached with with them is like yeah. third body, no, sir? Yes, we can consider that as third body. And, so, sir, and muscle parts, sir? Uh, uh, about okay. muscles, sir? So, uh, we will discuss the biotribology later. But yes, since you have asked the question, so in the case of hip or knee, uh, basically the end of the bone is covered with cartilage. So this cartilage has got several things. Um, and um, this cartilage actually provides the lubrication, the necessary lubrication. And, uh, but they do come in contact with each other. And, but they have uh, water as the lubrication. Water and mixed with some other proteins and other boundary lubricants. So that acts as a lubricant. So in the body, generally we do not have third body. The third body, if it is created, I mean, we can call the lubrication as the third body, but if you consider third body as the debris material, generally in the body we do not have debris material. But it can happen because of any kind of disease or any kind of injury. And in that case, the cartilage basically gets damaged and that uh, causes pain and also uh, friction and wear issue. So, and the muscle that you are talking about, muscles are basically to, um, to hold our bones and joints nicely together. They provide the strength around it because uh, without the muscle strength, we, our bones will not be able to function the way they function. Basically, there will be too much of load. They will come in touch, contact with each other. The lubricant will get squeezed out. And that is not good. That is the, the that will lead to some problems like arthritis. So, is that okay? Yes, sir. Uh, so, the cartilage to cartilage interaction happens and cartilage is not just the cartilage, it has got a lot of lubricant in it, but the muscle is not part of the interface. Okay. So, the tribological uh, problems that we, we uh, traditionally deal with are uh, for uh, bearings, uh, gears, cams, brakes, engine cylinder and piston uh, and so on. The tire between tire and the road, the clutches, different types of seals. Um, okay, so and the manufacturing processes. In different types of manufacturing processes we have um, tribological issues but there are many other areas of tribological applications which normally we don't know but it is there. For example, biotribology. Just now we were talking about biotribology. Biotribology is a new growing field and there are a lot of uh, application of tribological principles in biotribology. Then people talk about green tribology. Uh, green tribology is also related to our traditional tribology but with better lubrication, higher efficiency, reducing the wear. So that means if you can reduce energy consumption by reducing friction, you are basically contributing to green uh, environment, green, and that is called green tribology. And also there is one more emphasis is what kind of lubricants should we use? 
traditionally we have used lubricants which are very chemically very um, very rich and that means they, they have a lot of chemicals in them and especially sulfates and phosphates uh, as well as the mineral oil so these are potential uh, harm for environment and our current focus is is uh, severely on how to make the environment better um, how to make water ground and air better and therefore tribology plays green tribology plays a very very important role so we will try to understand about this part as well how tribology is being applied to many new technologies for example hydrogen based technology where we use fuel cells um, and any other kind of things uh, electric vehicle is another thing where new way of applying tribological principles are um, are in demand and therefore we should understand the basics very thoroughly so that we can apply these basics of tribological principles to all kinds of new challenges new technological challenges so as uh, this picture shows uh, the three important parts the interfacial pair the system and the environment and the third body okay so okay in the third body there is one more thing which we which is important is uh, is transfer layer the transfer layer is formed when two surfaces or two solid bodies will uh, rub against each other in dry or even in lubricated sliding okay so when they rub against each other one of the material which is uh, softer will get deposited on the counter surface that means the the other body second body and this is called transfer film transfer films are uh, both in some way we can say it is wear debris but this wear debris is not loose wear debris it has been deposited on the second material second solid and therefore it it in in some way it helps it helps to reduce friction and to some extent and it helps to reduce wear to a large extent so this transfer film is also a third body which is quite beneficial for uh, some tribological pairs but in some tribological pairs this transfer film may not be very durable uh, uh, may not be very adhering to the solid uh, second solid and therefore it will get removed and that will increase the wear so again we have to look at case by case uh, method in terms of interface pairs we are dealing with uh, different types of materials the first important one is metal on metal so how metal uh, how the tribology of metal on metal plays its role then we have other options we can also use polymers polymer on metal or polymer on polymer and both metal and polymers can be used in the form of composites so this is another important aspect uh, and in fact all materials that we use are in the form of composites then comes the ceramics ceramics are also being used as ball bearing and other kinds of interfacial pairs so ceramics on ceramics or ceramics on metal so these are all options available to us and whenever we are doing the design we can use them as um, as appropriate now I have just listed down the history of tribology that we had discussed last time um, <clears throat> with the ear. So Le Leonardo da Vinci actually he produced the sketches of experimental devices for friction measurement, okay? but he did not leave behind any text. So we do not understand what he was thinking about. But those sketches are good examples. They they tell us much about tribology. Then 1699, uh, Amantans actually he gave the um, two laws of friction, um, the first law and the second law. So Amantans was the first person to do a systematic study of tribology 
uh, especially friction. And in those times, uh, people were more concerned about friction and not wear. Obviously, because um, people were not still not using uh, the the machines that we have, they were still um, you know concerned about movement of stones or movement of things on the ground. So people were not concerned about wear, but friction was people were fully aware of friction, and Amantans gave the uh, the laws which we will discuss later. Coulomb's um, actually proposed the third law of friction and he just proposed that friction is independent of relative speed and here again he meant dry sliding okay not lubricated sliding then much of the um, studies and awareness about tribology came from 1883 when petrov and tower independently they conducted these experiments uh, again, we will discuss about Towers experiment a uh, little more in detail. So he published experimental work on the lubrication of journal bearing and showed that there was lubricant pressure in the bearing which could have separated the bearing from the journal surface by a fluid film. So the application of fluid in tribology started from this time, around this time. Uh, of course, the lubricants were being used, but the way we use as full fluid lubrication like hydrodynamic lubrication which started with these two uh, experiments and uh, okay this this year is not correct reynolds um, i think 86 85 or 86 reynolds uh, produced this hydrodynamic calculation theoretical calculation for understanding the fluid film and this is the foundation of uh, hydrodynamic lubrication that we will discuss and much uh, happened between these two times and in 1950 uh, Bowden and Tabor uh, they showed that friction force is controlled by two phenomena two phenomena first to bear the externally applied normal load and the second to overcome the attractive intermolecular forces. So they actually uh, provided this principle that the interatomic or intermolecular forces also play very very important role and based on this actually we, we have two model um, theory for friction which we will discuss later. Around the same time, Archer actually gave the uh, equation for wear, wear of a pair of material. So, so far until this time, uh, people had not so much um, studied wear in so much of detail, but Archer made a good detailed uh, study of wear and he gave a wear coefficient. He gave an equation which includes the wear coefficient so now with this equation we can um, we can differentiate between materials which material is more wear resistant than the other so first let's start with uh, uh, discussing about friction so when two solids under a force pressing against each other are slid in relative motion a force is experienced that opposes the sliding motion and this force is known as friction force. So we understand that when two solid surfaces are in contact, so for example here I have got solid 1 and solid 2. So in this if we apply certain load, so here uh, some load is being applied and therefore these two solids are in intimate contact here, you know, because of uh, load there has to be some contact it, and and we apply some force here to move solid 1 against solid 2 so they are just kept and as we apply the force these solids will experience the friction force and this is same as the force that we need to apply externally to make solid 1 move so so this will be the opposing force and this is known as the friction force. 
so please note that the friction force will act at the interface at the interface not not above it not at any other point but at the interface so so this relation is very uh, very common friction force is proportional to the normal load applied and if we do the equation then we can find coefficient of friction as mu so mu is the coefficient of friction which is the ratio of friction force to normal load so this rule or this is the part of the first law of uh, uh, friction is generally applicable to our normal cases normal engineering cases but if we study it more thoroughly we will find that this rule may not always apply so one important thing is here the consideration is the apparent area so the apparent this area is the apparent area okay but if we consider uh, true area the true contact area then this uh, rule may not apply and uh, so so there are some exceptions but generally this rule is uh, applicable so therefore it is considered as the first law of friction also we know that friction can be written as uh, a multiplied by the shear strength of the interface uh, either k or sometimes we write tau s so friction force that we apply here is equal to the contact area multiplied by the shear strength of the contact of the interface so k small k here is shear strength of the interface so strictly speaking it is the interface but sometimes people also take it as the shear strength of the material so, uh, softer material of this two and if we write uh, the load we can also write load approximately as area multiplied by the hardness hardness of the softer material so that means we can say that mu is equal to k over h and if we use k value of the softer material and h value of the again softer material then it will be a constant because these are material properties so it will be a constant and roughly it will be in the range of 0.2 so if we consider this theoretical analysis the coefficient of friction can be said as a constant it is a constant of 0.2 but in in reality it is not a constant it will vary and it will vary uh, for different uh, conditions as we change the condition the friction coefficient of friction will vary so this is just for our theoretical understanding but in practice this is not true friction is actually till, yeah sir till now we are not concerned about uh, static and kinetic friction no? yeah after this we will go into the static and kinetic okay so uh, there are different ways of looking at friction and there are different types of friction so often it it can get confusing for for people so this is the traditional way that you must have learned before uh, how to define friction but after this we will go into the uh, static and the uh, kinetic or dynamic friction so friction is basically energy dissipation at the interface so di energy dissipation means there are lot of energy is being dissipated is wasted here okay and in what form is this energy being wasted what is the form of energy sir uh, like in sound uh, in sound form and uh, the material which are removed okay. in thermal energy in thermal form thermal energy yeah 
So thermal energy is one of the biggest part, right? So biggest part of energy is converted into thermal energy and thermal energy comes from the material deformation, the plastic deformation that you, you just talked about, as well as the bonding, debonding of the interface. So the interface is formed because of the interatomic uh, forces and you try to debond it, break the bond. So that is also energy dissipation in the form of heat. So heat is the, the biggest contributor to this energy dissipation and uh, of course sound also can be there and uh, also the material deformation so for example material will deform here where particles will be formed so all the form of energy dissipation okay so friction is really an energy dissipation process so <clears throat> we have to try to reduce this energy dissipation if we want to reduce friction okay and for that reason, we have to apply, uh, let's say, lubrication so that we can separate the surfaces okay? or we can apply some coatings. This will also uh, separate the two surfaces or we can conduct proper material selection process so that we select materials which are naturally giving us low coefficient of friction between solid 1 and solid 2. But again, we cannot just change the material because this material selection is also based on other needs, other needs of the, the machine or machine element. Okay? And very important ones are the load and the speed. So based on the load and the speed of the bearing surfaces, we have to select the material so we may have some limitation about this part so therefore often our uh, uh, solutions are based on lubrication or the coatings as the case may be but there are some situations where these two options are also not feasible for example just now we were talking about bioturbology in bioturbology you cannot add any lubrication because it is part of our body. We cannot just uh, introduce any lubricant in our body. Similarly, coatings. Coatings are also not easily applied to our body. Uh, similarly, other uh, application could be space tribology, space application, where lubrication is not feasible because in the space it is vacuum. And in the vacuum, the lubricants will not work because they will evaporate. So in the space perhaps coating is more suitable or proper material selection. Okay. So similarly depending upon the application, depending upon the situation, we have to find out what kind of solution we want for our engineering system. Now other, another important aspect we should understand in friction is the contact area. So later we will see the proper contact area equation which is called Hertz analysis. But here let's try to understand the contact area because contact area is very very important. So when two bodies are together, let's say this is the surface of the body 1 and this is the surface of body 2. So this is known as the apparent area. So this is apparent area. Means the area which is visible to us. It looks like that they are in contact this apparent. But in reality, they will not be, uh, the actual contact area will not be like this. It will be much smaller. And the reason is that both surfaces has got some asperities so roughness which is basically roughness. Yes. so surface one and let's say surface two so i'm just exaggerating this roughness but this is the way it is so you will see that even though the apparent area is from here to here the true area is only this much okay which is will be which will be just fraction of the apparent area so 
so friction is influenced by the true contact area okay and uh, not the apparent area so it depends upon the true contact area so if we are increasing the true contact area then friction can increase okay um, so these two things we have to understand about the contact area the apparent contact area mm -hmm. and the true contact area so now uh, this we are coming to static friction and kinetic friction sometimes it is also known as dynamic friction so when you record friction in a dry sliding case uh, we just take the case of dry sliding you record friction force as a function of time so at the beginning of the process when you are trying to uh, pull one solid against another then the friction force will rise with time here i have plotted with time not displacement okay so at some point it will reach the highest value so from here to here these are all static friction okay and this is the limiting friction of the static friction so sometimes people also call this as mu s because that is the maximum static friction we can experience okay. and as soon as the motion starts so this is the point that the two surfaces are still in contact with each other as as soon as the relative motion starts that means this solid one has just started to move the friction coefficient will drop or friction force will drop to a lower value and then it will continue in the same value or it might just fluctuate depending upon the situation but this will be definitely lower than this highest value or the limiting static friction so this is called kinetic friction or dynamic friction and this is called static friction if we i plot if i plot this uh, with distance then we can say that from distance zero it can start going like this so, so something like this it's yeah constant no after a starting of uh, motion motion uh, then you do like draw like parabola but that means curve yeah in fd graph yeah here you you mean here yes yeah actually yes you you may say that it it should just come down immediately and then remain like this constant yeah constant yeah you can say that but actually in uh, what i'm trying to plot is the real situation in actual situation you may find that it takes some time before you you achieve the lowest value here and also here i have drawn like this that means the friction coefficient can actually fluctuate and it does fluctuate so so this we have to understand so whenever we are reporting a coefficient of friction it is always an average value average of the the scatter whatever scatter we get okay so in real practice it is not fixed fixed at some point now another important thing is when this kind of behavior is being seen that means static friction is much higher than kinetic friction then it leads to what is called a stick slip stick slip effect so a stick slip effect or phenomenon is basically a result of this high static friction and low dynamic friction so in many cases when you are conducting the friction test uh, for example with time you will find that friction force and time you will find that friction increases with time and then it drops all of a sudden it drops to some value let's say and then again it increases like this again it drops again it increases so like the tooth of a uh, saw it behaves in this way so this is called stick slip effect and because of this stick slip effect it can lead to 
many problems and one very important problem is vibration so in any machine if you see there is a vibration because of friction uh, it is the stick slip effect and in fact often we need to understand if vibration is taking place then where it is coming from and good chance is that it is coming from the stick slip effect so to generally it is not good only few cases stick slip is is good so um, for example one one example of stick slip motion is uh, violin so have you played violin no sir no Not okay any. so no, violin sir. actually works on the principle of stick slip so in violin you have got this kind of uh, high tension wires right wires in high tension and you have got another bow which which also has got something like a wire or um, string and you slide that string up and down on these wires right this is the the way we do and this produces the sound okay so this is the case of violin and this sound coming out of the violin is a effect of stick slip okay so otherwise you you might wonder why why there is a sound when one wire is just sliding over the other so this is coming from stick slip motion and therefore it is important that the coefficient of friction or the frictional property of this string or the bow bow wire has to be maintained very nicely very appropriately so that you get the best effect and that's why you see the violinist will always rub uh, some wax some waxy thing on it to make sure that the coefficient of friction is just appropriate so that you can get very good stick slip okay so this is one case where stick slip is is good and uh, but in most of our engineering application stick slip is not considered as good so okay so today just for today i thought maybe i should finish here so here i would like to show you the stick slip sound the first one is a squeaky door and the next sound is sound from a violin so both are from stick slip but they have very different effects mm -hmm.